what this is all about is your right to freedom of speech. What made America great is an independent, vigorous press. If a jerk burns a flag, America is not threatened. Political speech is the heart of the First Amendment. They're expressing their religious beliefs. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all the parties. Welcome to a special edition of Speaking Freely at the Tin Pan South Festival here in Nashville. I'm Ken Paulson. Today we'll take a look at a collaboration among three remarkable musicians. At the heart of the project is a legendary singer, actor, and poet. We are pleased to welcome Art Garfunkel. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm real happy to be here. Great to have you. Um, I had the great pleasure of seeing you perform at Ellis Island. Oh. What a remarkable night. This was at the end of your walk across America. That's right. And that, that walk took 14 years? Well, I did it in 40 different installments, always flying back to where I left off. So between the mid-80s and the mid-90s, I crossed the continent from my home in New York City to the Pacific. And then that led to that amazing night at Ellis Island, where you not only performed some of your greatest songs, you also reflected on your heritage. That's right. I mean, Ellis Island is the gate where they came from Eastern Europe into Manhattan. And then most, most immigrants moved on to the continent. My family stayed in New York City, and I am the third generation of, of that lineage. I was struck uh, reading about the early days of Simon and Garfunkel. Of course, you started as a rock and roll duo, Tom and Jerry. We, f we saw ourselves as, as children of the Everly Brothers, oh. rockabilly, we called it in those days. <laughs> well, here in Nashville, Tom and Jerry would be, would be very big and should have been very big. Uh, hey, School Girl was your first hit. In high school in the 50s. And you, so you were a co-writer, actually, in the beginning. Yeah. Uh, although this new album that we'll be talking about uh, marks your return as a songwriter, you've actually been at it for a good few decades. That's right. I mean, after our early high school days when Paul Simon and I were writers of these of these Buddy Holly kind of <clears throat> country rock and roll songs. Then came the age of Bob Dylan, and Paul became this wonderful first-rate poetic writer, and I easily deferred to that talent through our whole famous career. I have to ask, did you ever cross path, paths with Everly Brothers? I saw Phil Everly outside the Brill Building on Broadway in New York in the 50s wearing a sharp black suit and boots with Cuban heels, and, and I knew who he was very well. He didn't know me. He was looking for directions, where to find a certain <laughs> music building, and I had the honor of helping him uh, find where he was going, and then I just retreated. That's, that's it. I gather he didn't recognize you. No. Nope. Not, from, not from Tom and Jerry. What I found uh, very interesting is, is a struggle you had, and speaking of your heritage, um, and once Tom and Jerry had disappeared and once... Simon and Garfunkel had gotten back together again after t Paul had been a solo performer for a little while in, in Britain. You had to decide whether you were going to be Simon and, and Garfunkel. And that was actually a discussion about whether that name was too ethnic. You bet. And, and we categorically rejected the name. It was, for us, it was definitely the absence of a name. And while we struggled to find a name, we failed. And so we went with our real names by default. And I, I, I can remember Tom Wilson, our producer at Columbia Records, saying, oh, hell, it's 65, meaning it's such a modern era. Let's go with their real names. And because people would respond to Jewish names as being too ethnic and would not respond to the record, is that the idea? It sounded like a law firm. <laughs> <laughs> when you did enter the studio with Paul Simon, um, you put out an album that, uh, that sold moderately well but didn't ensure a success long term. And in fact, was there a time when you thought perhaps Simon and Garfunkel was a one album project? Not even one. I mean, that first album of 1964 to 5, Wednesday morning, 3 a.m., which had the sound of silence in it, was not happening. And Paul went off to England and was a folk singer, and I went back to college where I was an architecture student uptown at Columbia. Until about a year later when uh, the record company was saying, we're getting a whole cult of call-ins in the Florida area around one of the titles on this folk album. 
and they just won't quit. It's like Rocky Horror Picture Show. <laughs> and it's the sound of silence, and we think you should act on it because the fans are saying there's something about this tune. But you added a little bit. So as we were away in England, Tom Wilson put on an electric 12-string, the fashionable sound of that season, the birds and Mr. Tambourine Man, and, and they added a drum and bass and, and superimposed on Paul's guitar and our voices this sort of rock and roll backing. <clears throat> and they played it for me when I got back for the summer, and I said, well, you have to let it go. I mean, I had no artistic integrity to stand on. I was a guy trying to get on the radio. <laughs> and slowly in that fall of 65 it climbed and I watched my life change every week it, the, the ceiling of my world opened up further and what a remarkable combination Paul Simon's writing certainly his voice, his guitar and, and your what has been described as an angelic voice a flawless voice when did you know you had this gift? how old were you? five really? <laughs> As a very young kid, I saw I have something lucky going on here, <clears throat> and it behooves me to be serious about it and enjoy it and don't mess it up and don't scream. <clears throat> and I always like to say, because it's, it's my memory of grade school, kids would walk down the stairwell and walk home from school, and I would linger in the back because I fell in love with tiled stairwells. There's the reverb that we singers love. Everybody who sings in the shower knows what I mean. And I'd stand, and, and I'd, the kids would go home, and I would sing You'll Never Walk Alone from Carousel or those goosebump inspirational songs, and I would go, I have some lucky thing going on here. And Paul Simon reportedly saw you for the first time in the third grade? Yeah, third or fourth grade, I was the singer in the talent show. I was very blonde. The girls liked me. <laughs> <laughs> Did Paul have a talent at that time? He says to me, it's, that's when he realized singing is, is the ticket. Wow. And he's, and although I met him in the sixth grade when I was an 11 year old, <clears throat> uh, he said, I was laying for you for a couple of years. I knew you were the kid in the neighborhood I wanted to know. And the reason why you thought I was so funny is because I was pitching to win you over with all my best material. And since we were timed in our ages, ideally, to be smitten with, with rock and roll. You know, Elvis came along just about the next year when Paul and I were 12. So this is something that McCartney knows and Dylan knows. We're of that age to be just perfect to be hit with rock and roll. And, and we began to start writing and singing together. Now, you described the first moment you knew you had magic. When did you and Paul first harmonize? It's hard to remember. We had home tape recorders. We were in love with the fun of recording into a tape recorder and setting up a second tape recorder so the playback of the first would be something we could sing to into the live mic of the second recording. So we were building up sound on sound. And I guess right in the beginning, my ear said, it's, it's very accurate. And then I was, I've been a rehearsal freak all my life. I love to detail it until it's until it's right. So early in junior high school, we started having a pretty professional sound. As your career proceeded, um, Paul did most of the songwriting, but you had a, a hand in a lot of the creative process. You helped with uh, the melody to Scarborough Fair. You also did something that is just haunting on bookends. I understand you went into the nursing homes uh, to record. Paul was working <clears throat> on a sequence of songs making a whole side so that the songs would be unified. And the theme was birth to old age. And the spirit and the tempo of the songs would keep aging and getting slower and have more gravity. And uh, when we knew we were going to end with a song about old people, we wanted to set it up with the sound of old people, live recordings of people, people doing what I'm doing, <clears throat> clearing the throat and sounding, and just having the the back of the throat sounds of so you would have a visceral connection with the theme of the next song and I did all these tape recordings and we began to love the content of what they were saying and we edited it down to set that up but my real contribution beyond singing in those years was as record producer I was the man behind the glass in the control room sending the vocals of Paul and Artie out on mic and along with Paul and Roy Halley we produced our records so if you, if you want to know how I look at that whole career from my point of view, we were not so much singers or writers, we were record makers. 
the record maker chooses the structure of the song, the tempo, picks the musicians who will play, what the groove is, and so that's what we controlled. Can you talk about the birth of one of your greatest songs, Mrs. Robinson? Mrs. Robinson came along when we were working with Mike Nichols on the film The Graduate. <clears throat> he had uh, commissioned Paul to write three songs, and Paul wrote a song which later became Punky's Dilemma for Dustin Hoffman floating in the pool, and Mike said, mm, I don't know about that. What else you got? And as he waited for Paul to write new things, he was living with our pre-existing songs. And he began to slot Scarborough Fair in this place, and Sounds of Silence will go here, waiting for the new songs. And he fell in love with those songs as was. So he no longer needed anything, but he said, give me one new song. For the chase scene when Dustin is running down from Berkeley back to L.A., and Paul uh, had, was working on a song at which at that time was called Mrs. Roosevelt. <laughs> <laughs> and here's to you, Mrs. Roosevelt. That's how it went. So I said to Mike, well, there is a song in the making called Mrs. Roosevelt. I don't think Paul likes it, and we're about to chuck it. And Paul said, let me hear it. And Mike jumped on it. And um, so we played it for Mike, and he said, well, how could we resist that? It's perfect. Now you have to finish writing the song which we never did until the film was out. That's why in the film you hear, doot, 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 doot. there are no lyrics yet. <laughs> I understand Joe DiMaggio had mixed feelings about <laughs> where have you gone. Joe was a literalist. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, he didn't appreciate the metaphor, where have you gone, that early soulful America when heroes were heroes. This uh, show is about free expression and the way we express ourselves in, a, in America. I find it fascinating that some people were set on their heels by the line about Jesus. That a reference to Jesus in a popular song was something, Jesus loves you more than you will know, that that is something that would make people uneasy. Did, were you aware you were doing some groundbreaking there? No, never actually. There are buzzwords that jump out of sentences, and it's just the way we're all made. Whatever is human just is. You can't judge and you can't say anything. Well, you know, the Sinatra version you've heard of Mrs. Robinson. Yeah, what's he say? He says, Jilly loves you more than you will know. Ah, uh, there you go. His, his, his uh, barkeeper friend, Jilly, he's, he substituted it. And I, I'm certain that Jilly was a far more controversial figure than Jesus, <laughs> no matter where you lived. Paul wrote to the Sinatra people and said, you can't do that. That's my song. And the Sinatra people said, we're doing it. <laughs> so... Over a period of time, you become the most successful, certainly the most successful duo in pop music history. And you get invited to do a television special your way with Bell Telephone. Uh, and what a fascinating chapter that was. Can you talk about that process? Now you're into the theme of the show because that was a real confrontation with the powers that be in CBS. They were very nervous about the fact that we made an hour television special sponsored by Bell Telephone. This is as American as you can be. That had a humanist political statement to it. And it had Coretta King saying, I must remind you that starving a child is a form of violence. And it had some teeth to it. And we were very proud. And the executives at Bell began to get nervous. Are we being really universally uh, embracing enough to all the stations, even to all the stations? And they called in the executives, and one by one, nobody could commit. They couldn't decide what they felt about it. So they would bring in the next senior guy until the head would, guy would say, we can't abide by it. When you're showing Bridge Over Troubled Water, the first time we had aired it, you're showing the funeral of three Americans, Martin Luther King, Bobby Kennedy, and John Kennedy. They're all Democrats. We can't have that. <laughs> and we said, I, I guess they're all Democrats. Let's face it, they said, you're taking a political slant here. And we said, what's the politics? It's humanist. And that's the first time. Around. If you're humanist, you're, you're left of center, I guess. I thought humanity was the all and the everything. And uh, we wouldn't back down, and the sponsors pulled out just before airtime, and the networks went scrambling for a new sponsor at the last minute. And what happened? Alberto Culver V05. <laughs> 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 
they've always been known for their radical leanings. Uh, and did that in any way affect the way you looked at future projects? I mean, any kind of chilling effect when people walk out on a program you're proud of? Not really. There's a very important element that goes on. When you're selling a lot of records, you have a sense of personal power. If they don't like it, I'll find someone else who will because I have, I have clout. I have this important thing. I'm selling records, and I know there'll be a lot of people on my side. I suppose, you know, earlier in this very interview, I was saying when they put out a record where they doctored it, I didn't have any leg to stand on, and so you're in a different compromised position. We have to ask you about Bridge Over, Tro Over Troubled Waters. Um, this, this album was, I mean, for, for it to be your final album, that's what's so astonishing. So many bands have a peak moment, uh, and, and it sells more copies than ever before, and then they have to put out five more just like it. And you guys went out at the crest. Uh, and, and Bridge itself is such a phenomenal song. Can you talk about the recording of that? Did you know that this was going to be a song you were going to sing for the rest of your life? Not quite, but I knew it was coming out very good as, as I felt the whole album. You know, it, it, it may be delightful to hear it, but the first ears that hear one's own work are one's own ears. So you're your first spectator. And if it's good, it's, in, in layman's terms, it's a delight to hear it. And in the making of it, I can't tell you what a thrill it is to play that studio game of crafting rhythm, melody, words, and engineering. And uh, yes, I knew the whole album was turning out very good, and I felt uh, this, this Paul Simon and I have some kind of lovely combination here, along with Roy Halley. <clears throat> the Bridge Over Trouble Water song itself was originally a two-verse song that Paul wrote without the final Ceylon Silver Girl verse, and he wrote it for me, and it was pitched in the high register, and when I recorded it, it came to me that this is not the song, this is the setup for an as-yet-not-written final verse. And I said, Paul, let's take the record now and lift it off the ground with a third verse. If you'll write something that really goes from here, we'll produce, we'll bring in the kitchen sink. Step by step, we'll bring in instruments, and the record will open up. We were sort of influenced by Phil Spector's uh, production of the Righteous Brothers singing Old Man River, which had impressed Paul and I a lot, in which Phil has Bill Medley singing the entire Old Man River with just piano backing. And on the final line, and sick of trying, but old man... On that final line, he brings in the conga, the chorus, the girls singing, the rhythm, everything breaks out. And I, we thought, how cool to save production for the final line. And so that production technique is, is a big part of what makes Bridge Over Troubled Water an unusual thing. You also have had a, a remarkable solo career um, at a songwriters festival. I have to ask you, how, how did you make your way through the, the, a sea of songwriters and find the people you did? I mean, extraordinary talents like Jimmy Webb and Gallagher and Lyle, Albert Hammond. Um, you, I guess because you've worked with one of the best, you knew the best. Yeah, I have good taste, I think, and life is so much about what comes to you and what you're <laughs> aware enough to say yes to. It's, you know, when people ask, how did you choose this acting correct, you know, the phone rings one day and here comes an interesting offer and you have to go, I think this is, this is good. It's the power of the editor. There's the stream of everything coming at you and what you choose or what you realize is worthwhile is the key. And you went back to several people. I mean, Jimmy Webb has been on virtually all your albums. I'm crazy he? about his writing. He came into our studio before Paul and I were finished working with each other, and I'd never met him. And he's a charming uh, Oklahoman, and he sat down, knees together, playing his piano style. He was his father's church organist when he was a kid, and he played uh, this great piano weaving style, and I was uh, taken with him. You mentioned um, having a script shown to you. You've got a remarkable film career in, in that it's relatively brief. You only do a movie every seven, eight years or so on average. And the movies you make, everybody talks about, um, beginning with uh, Catch-22 and then Carnal Knowledge. And uh, you're the first guest we've had who's had a film taken to the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, 
a, uh, a city in, in Georgia declared carnal knowledge, which starred you and Jack Nicholson and uh, Anne Margaret. And Candace Bergen. And Candace Bergen. This film was declared obscene and could not be shown in Albany, Georgia. And that case was appealed all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. Were you surprised that this particular film generated so much controversy? Yeah. I don't know what to say about it. It's, you touch different people's sensitivities, and you never know. Uh, if we use the theory of let's be careful for everybody, we water down anything that makes any statement out of too much care. We see that in, in the insurance business now. The doctor can't touch you because there's a potential lawsuit. And this flattens out any kind of intelligence. There's a thing called too much safety and care. And from that experience, um, you were also in bad timing. Yeah. And boxing. There's a strong movie. That was a very powerful movie. Not a lot of people saw that. And Boxing Helena was not a musical either. <laughs> well said, Ken. You know, there's, there's my no... game in, in my life is to stay interesting to myself. So I keep looking f to not repeat myself, to stay alive. What's going to be a reach for me? What's going to get me a little scared? It's because anything worth doing starts with that. I'm just the right amount of risky on this. And that would define your films. You were never offered any of the Brady Bunch movies? Was that <laughs> never came up? I, I did eschew the mainstream. I look at a script and I go, what's, why does this film want to be made? What's the thrust of it? And so many of them want to turn a profit, and that's not quite good enough. Well, of course, it's great to be able to make those choices, to, to have the freedom to say, this is something I'll be proud of. I have had a lucky life. One of the things I've been struck by seeing both you and Paul Simon separately in concert is how well these songs that were once sung by both of you, powerfully, emotionally, um, they still work as individuals, and, and I'm, I'm not sure why. I don't, th I don't know how that's ah, possible. Ah, but what a tough time we had in the Grammy show just a month ago, getting this Lifetime Achievement Award, doing The Sound of Silence, and meshing our two different versions of The Sounds of Silence together. I must tell you, it was delightful working with Paul. Yeah, he was a sweetheart. But there were very sp specific problems with his way that he's come to sing it and mine and how we monitor sound differently and to hook that up and keep your grace was the devil's business well it worked it worked beautifully thank you and, and a great many people around the world were very glad to see the two of you together me too i wonder if we could prevail on you to do a song from the era sure let's show him kathy's song because i think of this as probably Paul's most beautiful love song to this day. I hear the drizzle of the rain Like a memory it falls Soft and Tapping on my roof and walls From the shelter of my mind Through the window of my eyes I gaze beyond the rain-drenched streets To England where my Distracted and diffused My thoughts are many miles away They lie with you when you're asleep And kiss you when you start your day And a song I was writing is left undone don't know why I spend my time writing songs I can't believe with words that tear and strain to run. And 
So you see, I have come to doubt All that I once held is true I stand alone without beliefs The only truth I know is you And as I watch the drops of rain 